for me to welcome you all to this session, this talk, this conversation uh, on, uh, on the topic of Jessica's uh, uh, recent book. Uh, it's a very expensive book, so I don't uh, assume that everyone's bought it yet. So you have to take extra work and work extra hours to get to buy this book. It's called The Internal Protection Alternative in Refugee Law. And it's based on your thesis, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, I have actually read the book, and it's a, it's a great pleasure to read. It's quite easy to read for, for me as a non-law scholar to, to read. It's actually possible to read. It's not too technical. And there are uh, a lot of examples, uh, lots of uh, you know, things that make it easier to, to read for, for the common man or common <laughs> woman. Um, my name is Jan Paul Brekke. I'm a researcher at the Institute for Social Research in Oslo. And this is my first time at CME, so I'm having a, a, a great day. It's, it's been a great pleasure to be to see this uh, this this great center and this uh, this environment for for research. Uh, we will. Uh, I'll just provide a little bit of context uh, to the book and to this work. In 2010, we started a refugee Norwegian Refugee Council project called uh, called Migration to Norway, and uh, one part of that study. <laughs> Was uh, consisted of lawyers looking at different aspects of the Norwegian uh, refugee regime and the international regime in relation to that, and what that, how that impacts policies and flows. Uh, and uh, Jessica continued that work, and on this ended up in this on this particular topic, and has now published the book. So we're very happy. This is kind of so the project is from 2010 until now. I feel like this is kind of finally kind of putting a bow a bow on everything, and that we've finalizing and, and cl getting closure finally on this project. So that's great. We're also, so Jessica, you, you're with the CMI and we'll I'll start a conversation a little bit. Uh, we're also very fortunate to have Jeff Crisper. Jeff is at, um, is, he has a double affiliation for, for the time being, uh, both at the Chatham House in, in London and then at the Refugee Studies Center at Oxford University. So uh, we're very happy to have Jeff here. And Jeff has been working with the UNHCR for uh, and know the field you know the field very well, as you will all hear in a little, little bit. But first, first off, I mean the internal uh, protection alternative. Is, it sounds a bit technical, so I'm, I think maybe we should just start off with a little bit of introduction about the the concept and how uh, how we are to understand this and where it comes from. So please, if you could just start a little bit, and I'll sit down. And you can start a little bit, Jessica, and tell us about the the internal um, uh, protection alternative. What what is this? What is this it? concept and this phenomenon? Okay, the um, the internal protection alternative um, is also called the internal flight alternative, internal relocation. It has it goes by many different names, and um, over the course of this conversation and in the book, I often use the acronym IPA. So if I refer to an IPA, I'm referring to the internal protection alternative. But what it is basically is an exception to refugee status that states invoke when they determine that an asylum seeker, a refugee claimant, um, has uh, an area of refuge within their country of origin. So for those of us who are sitting um, here in Norway and working in the Norwegian context, um, we often hear about the IPA in connection with returns to Afghanistan, returns to Kabul of um, families and individuals who come from conflict-affected areas um, in other parts of Afghanistan. Um, but it's also applied, I mean, it, obviously it's applied in, in conflict-affected countries, fragile states, but it's also applied um, in cases where people are alleging, for example, um, persecution by private actors. For example, um, a, a woman from Nigeria who has a claim related to um, gender-based violence or forced marriage um, might be told that she could relocate anonymously away from her family in a bigger city within uh, Nigeria. Um, and it's also applied in cases where um, the risk of persecution is determined to be sort of regionally centered. And um, again, in Norway, um, for a long time, this was the case with uh, Chechen refugee claims. So that's basically what, um, what the internal protection alternative or the IPA is about. Um, it has uh, kind of gained momentum, I would say, in the last um, 
10 years in response to the European harmonization agenda. So it's practiced uh, extensively within Europe, not by all states in Europe, um, in North America, in Australia, um, in New Zealand. Uh, there's some IPA practice in other parts of the world as well. Um, and it, it basically is uh, justified conceptually um, uh, through the idea that refugee um, protection is a backup or surrogate or substitute protection for the absence of protection um, provided by the state to its citizens or permanent residents. Um, so in addition to that, um, states and, and UNHCR and uh, judges had tr have tried to identify a kind of IPA limit within the refugee definition itself. And here I'm talking about the 1951 Refugee Convention and its 1967 protocol, which is the international uh, instrument uh, regulating status of refugees. So this lies outside of that? This is outside of that? Of that definition? Yes, yeah. Well, or no? Not that yeah. it's not, in, in, but as a legal instrument, it's on the side, right? It's not. Well, it's been read it's into not. the definition. I mean, so for example, UNHCR has um, has written that the IPA, the Internal uh, Protection Alternative, is sort of can be seen as part of a holistic assessment of the criteria for refugee status. Mm. And um, if you read the criteria for refugee status, you'll know that um, refugee status um, is conferred upon people who are outside their country of origin, who have a well-founded fear of persecution on the grounds of race, ethnicity, religion, political opinion, social group, and who are unable or unwilling because of that fear to avail themselves of state protection. So if you read um, that phrasing mm. carefully, there's no mention of, of an IPA limit, but states have determined that the reference to state protection there, that might give some space for an IPA limit. Um, Others look at the concept of a well-founded fear and argue that a fear is not well-founded if protection can be accessed elsewhere and mm. so forth. Mm. So um, there have been different ways of trying to integrate the IPA idea into the, into the definition. Mm. Um, but because, um, because there, there isn't any sort of consensus on how it relates to the definition, that was one of the things I was trying to clarify mm -hmm. in the book. Well, so just uh, put a pin in that and we'll come get back to your, to your findings. But let, let, just want to turn to you, uh, Jeff, on the... We were hearing that uh, Jessica say that... She says that this concept and this phenomenon has kind of made a return into, into the agenda of, uh, in Europe. And, but I thought this was, doesn't it have a different history? Could you just say a few words about that and the, the, its position within a, within a broader context of international protection? Yeah, in fact, I, I was actually quite a little bit surprised uh, when I heard about the publication mm -hmm. of the book and when I was invited to come to this launch because it is a concept that I associate very much with a slightly earlier period, mm -hmm. for, for the mid-1990s and the late 1990s when there was a very sudden influx of people into Europe, and this was one of the key responses to that particular situation. And I thought it had kind of taken a little bit of a back seat since that time. And I think more recently, well, whereas IPA is basically about getting rid of people that you don't want on your territory now, <laughs> more recently it's been a focus on externalization. In other words, making sure that those people never actually get to your country in the first place. But I was kind of intrigued looking at the book to hear that this practice is still continuing. One of the questions I had um, for Jessica was the extent to which we can actually monitor the implementation of this practice. Do we know how many states apply it? Mm. Do we know how many people per year it's applied to? Do we know how many people are actually sent back to their country of origin on the basis of some kind of an IPA assessment? Mm. Yeah. Please. Yeah, yeah. Oh. no, that's a good question. And the answer is we, we don't know. And no. the reason... Um, is because, first of all, most states who um, apply the IPA uh, don't keep records of the grounds on which an application yeah. was refused. Um, that's one reason. Um, the second reason is because um, even if states do identify um, a refusal on the basis of an IPA, um, in practice, it gets 
really confusing because um, it's often like considered as a secondary basis for refusing the claim. There is um, a construction that I found in a lot of the cases I read um, that is sometimes called like the even if formulation. So even if what this person is saying about the conditions in Afghanistan or whatever is true, so when there's a credibility issue or an issue about the assessment of an actual risk, then the person would have an, an IPA. So it, it doesn't really matter on what basis we make this um, assumption. And I know that's true in, in Norway for just reasons of sort of efficiency in asylum determination procedures. Caseworkers are you know, encouraged to kind of identify the kind of easiest threshold on which to justify their decisions. So, um, so there's a lot of reasons why it's hard to capture the actual numbers of people okay. it affects. Mm. And a quick, a quick follow-up to that is, um, to what extent do we know whether in Norway or in other countries it's possible to appeal against IPA determinations through the higher courts? And to, if so, to what extent are people successful in challenging it? In challenging that. Um, I don't know the answer to the second question, but I will say that often um, the IPA issue is only really substantively addressed at the appeal st stage um, because often, um, and this is based on just some a, a small amount of empirical research in Norway and all the UK and other places in, in Northern Europe, often um, the um, claimant isn't really prepared to give evidence about the possibility of return to some other place in their country of origin because it doesn't necessarily occur to them that they need to, um, th this is like even part of the assessment of refugee status. So where really the issues come out and um, lawyers come on board and try and buttress, um, buttress uh, the um, determination is really at the appeal stage, at least at least that's the case um, here, here in Norway. So, so it is the topic of mm. appeals. Um, and you've chosen Afghanistan as your primary case study, I think. Is this mm. a, a phenomenon that's particularly relevant to, to Afghanistan? And if so, why Afghanistan? No, I think um, Afghanistan isn't... Uh, I, so the, the piece itself, the, the book itself, is really kind of a... Um, a, a dogmatic legal analysis. I have one chapter that's looking at practice in Norway. Mm -hmm. And um, there I talk a lot about Afghanistan because the um, application of the IPA in Afghan cases has been like a, a long running uh, topic of uh, debate and also mm. political debate. Um, mm. You've been following this as well mm. since 1998 mm. maybe and especially in 2008. So this particular issue around, um, for example, the availability of networks upon return and this sort of effective links assessment has been um, especially relevant for the Afghan cases. Mm. Um, well, we could, maybe we could get back to the, the Somali case as well and then and the yeah. Afghan case as you, as you, yeah. and the Norwegian uh, policies towards those uh, or uh, implementing IPA to, towards those two contexts. But uh, could you just first uh, mention a few of the findings or the, what you kind of yeah. find in this in this report, how are your conclusions? Oh, so and then we can get back to kind of the details. On the policy, yeah. Um, that. Well, I think the, I just wanted to say a little bit more about sort of the motivation for writing about this because, I mean, I talked a little bit about its un uncertain basis in, in refugee law, um, but also the practical consequences of an IPA um, uh, have been problematic from the perspective of legal security because the safeguards that states apply um, to the same groups or to um, even even within countries, uh, decision makers tend to apply different criteria um, for determining who has a valid um, IPA. So, uh, so it's a problem also for the actual human security of people being returned. Um, some states, UNHCR has consistently maintained that um, in order to uh, apply the internal protection alternative, um, the area of return has to be safe and it has to be reasonable for, um, for the claimant to return. That uh, 
formulation is kind of a way of accommodating the IPA with the overarching goals of the convention, which are to, pro um, to protect people from return to ill treatment, first and foremost, non refoulement and then also to sort of pave the way for assimilation in a new community. So by kind of translating those values, I guess, to the I IPA um, context, uh, this safety and reasonableness um, formulation uh, was was developed and has been um, uh, domesticated in many jurisdictions, not in Norway, but we can talk about that. But um, but at the same time, the criteria for what constitutes safety and what constitutes reasonableness is um, really uh, difficult to pin down mm -hmm. and has been a, a, applied in really disparate ways. Um, and so that's obviously a problem, and it raises the risk that people actually are returned to, um, to ill treatment. Um, the other sort of problem that I tried to kind of um, tackle in the book was the fact that there's very little empirical evidence about what happens mm. to people after they return, um, and whether the assumptions on which an IPA decision is made actually resonate with the experience of, of people upon return. And this is especially the case with respect to actors of protection. For example, in many IPA cases, um, you'll see references to, of course, the state as an actor of protection, but also um, non-state actors, uh, even private individuals uh, mm. can seek refuge with the brother's family mm. here and mm. there. So um, so there's a lot of, there's quite a disconnect there, I guess, between sort of the legal, te legal technical approach to um, determining protection and the empirical mm. evidence of it. Um, so then getting to your question about the findings, um, yes. what I tried, yeah, what I tried to do was um, propose a way of understanding the IPA that is consistent with the object and the purpose of the convention. Mm -hmm. And so um, I suggested that rather than kind of trying to read into the definition, um, an IPA exception, because I felt that that really, um, uh, that really required a leap of <laughs> faith in terms of like the normal meaning of, of words and so forth, that it should instead be understood as a limit on the scope of protection. And by, by formulating it this way, um, you are giving the asylum claimant, you're recognizing that the person has a well-founded fear of persecution with regard to some area of their home country. Mm. So they have a legal position, but this legal position can in some circumstances be limited. Mm. Um, with reference to the long-term um, uh, need to ensure that international protection, which is a limited good, mm. um, is extended to those cases that actually mm. deserve it. It, it sounds like uh, um, it sounds like I mean the the safety issue of return mm. um, is is kind of is at the very base of this um, being protected against ill treatment, uh, non refoulement but then in addition to that, you said reasonableness is a criteria. We could go back to the Norwegian context. But also I remember from the UNHCR, the discussions on dignity and dignified return. And, <laughs> and how, how, could you just say a few words about that history of the world dig dignity well, um, in this context? The UNHCR policy and position on voluntary repatriation is set up in something called the UNHCR Voluntary Repatriation Handbook. Mm. And that specifies very clearly that repatriation should only take on, base, uh, on a voluntary basis, in conditions of safety, and in conditions of dignity for the returning refugee. If you look at that handbook, the sections on safety and voluntariness are quite well elaborated. When it comes to dignity, it's very clear UNHCR ha hasn't a clue what dignity <laughs> okay. is, because what it does is simply reproduces the Oxford English Dec it, Oxford dictionary. English Dictionary definition of what dignity is. Right, it seems to right. suggest, you know, it sounds like a great phrase, but when you dig into it, it's not really clear. Mm. You know, and I would yeah. argue that in many recent occasions, refugees have been returned to their country of origin, not in conditions of dignity. Mm, mm. Um, the Rohingya refugees in Bangladesh are at risk of being sent back in undignified conditions, and the same applies to Syrians in Lebanon at the moment. So it's very much a topical issue, mm, even though mm. it's still historically yeah. rooted. Yeah, because it, it sounds like uh, you mentioned in the book that uh, social and economic conditions, yeah. in addition to the, to the safety issue, which I guess 
social and academic conditions would would have something to do with the dignity uh, concept. So what what yeah. what has to be in place, for example, in Kabul, if we if we as Norwegian government or the Norwegian government sends uh, people back to uh, the, to the an IPA situation in Kabul, what are apart yeah. from the safety, which is in itself a topic of discussion whether it's safe or not, but the, the, the economic and social conditions, what, what are the minimum standards for that? Yeah, um, well, I think this, uh, it's, a, it's a good question. I just want to point out that maybe, I hope that we can have a chance to discuss, I mean, the issue of safety is not only about the absence of, of, of risk, okay, but that's so one, yeah, 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 please, please go that, ahead. Um, that it's also about the presence of protection. So I think that the safety, um, Analysis in these cases um, is also more robust than than people sometimes are, are led to believe. But that relates to this protection from uh, return to ill treatment, both direct and indirect forms of ill treatment. And their social and economic rights also play a role. Mm. Um, serious ill treatment can certainly arise as a consequence of uh, social and economic uh, deprivation. But um, I mean... The interesting thing is that, like, conceptually, the IPA is completely, uh, or at least there's a paradox there between IPA practice and um, this durable solution agenda mandate um, goal of refugee policies more generally. Because in many cases, you're uh, returning people to situations of prolonged displacement, um, internal displacement. So you're either prolonging or creating new situations of internal displacement, which often, um, you know, relates to uh, um, protection and assistance needs that are distinguished from from people who are permanently resident in, in these places. So in terms of, of dignity, I mean, I think we also have a lot to gain from, um, you know, discussions around IDPs and, and other things. In the book, I take kind of... Um, I look to the rules of treaty interpretation, basically, to make the argument that um, that where a treaty doesn't answer a question directly, um, you're co you're compelled to look at uh, other areas of law that relate to that topic. So in in this topic, it would be obviously from human rights law, humanitarian law, mm. et cetera. And so, um, so I discuss why um, issues that are outside the formal scope of safety, not only um, social economic rights, but also things like past persecution, uh, the return of people to um, like areas, uh, the, the, pro, uh, the um, the relationship between ethnic cleansing, for example, and return, like returning people to areas where, yeah, they might be safe there, but it's as a consequence of, of ethnic cleansing from other areas. And sort of the relationship between all of these norms that are related to IPA practice and um, the the IPA test itself, mm. and I and I really argue that um, the the practice should try and align with these values underpinning mm. um, refugee protection, including um, the achievement of of durable solutions. Can I play devil's yeah. advocate for a second? Yeah, there could be an argument. Some people would make the argument: Look, Kabul is probably a city of a million people. Probably a very high proportion of those people, 500,000, 700,000, they're either orphaned, widowed, um, injured, disabled, don't have access to work, have really poor shelter and accommodation. Yeah. So why shouldn't somebody be sent back to those conditions? They're no worse than any other Afghan is going to experience. Is that, is that an argument that's advanced in support of IPA? I think, yeah, I mean... Um Definitely in state practice, you get those like relativistic arguments where they compare, they compare returnee, the situation for returnees mm -hmm. to other people or even other IDPs. Mm -hmm. um, that practice is, is um, pretty consistently acknowledged as um, incompatible with, with, uh, the, with the IP test. But yeah, no, definitely that's an argument um, that, that you hear a lot, especially in the context of Afghanistan where you have okay, maybe a few thousand returnees from some European countries, but then you have a million returnees from neighboring right. countries, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. And, um, and, but you know, this is, this is a test that applies in individual status determination. And uh, it, it, is, it, it has to be uh, applied consistently with the overall ambitions of that, of that treaty, I think. Could, mm. So uh, 
The, the, you mentioned in your book the importance of uh, information about the country of origin. And uh, that has been on the table at the European, on the European agenda as well uh, with regard to the Commission's uh, uh, proposal for, for new, a new um, processing regime um, where the country of origin uh, information should be equal for all countries and uh, they have to adhere to the same list and, uh, and in renewal and, and uh, where they consider revo uh, revo possible revocation of cases. But anyway, the, the, the country of origin list uh, and, and the assessment of the conditions there, what is the importance of that in this IPA? How is this used in the, in the IPA context? Yeah, the country of origin information um, has traditionally been kind of a weak spot in IPA practice because um, many country of origin um, materials, with the exception of UNHCR, um, eligibility guidelines don't really address um, situations of internal displacement in any great detail, and certainly not with respect to um, not with respect to every kind of category of case that ar arrives uh, arises. Right. Mm. So um, this is slowly changing. I, I think um, last week or the week before, I noticed that EASO, this European agency that creates country of origin reports, um, came out with something on um, internal mobility in Iraq, which is clearly produced to um, give arguments uh, in support of or against uh, returns to other areas of Iraq. Um, and it's interesting, it's framed as internal mobility and not the internal flight alternative or a protection alternative. Um, but I also think that even with the same material, states will interpret concepts like safety, just the basic concept, really differently. And it seems to be inevitable. I mean, there is um, there are s several sources that you know all states rely on, and still we have really distinct uh, interpretations of what... Um, yeah, where the threshold is, really. Mm. Mm. So, yeah. You, Jeff? In some way, there is nothing in the Refugee Convention to suggest that the presence of protection in a country of origin can defeat a claim to refugee status. Given that statement, was it ever a viable option for UNHCR simply to say, we don't believe this concept has a founding or a basis in international refugee law and we're going to oppose it implacably? What, it's, what seems to have happened, as happens to most issues, UNHCR has engaged with the issue and has yeah. made some concessions on the issue. Mm. And I wonder, by engaging with states on the issue, has it uh, actually been able to moderate their behaviour and to mm. influence the way this principle is actually applied in, in practice? Yeah, well, um, I think, you know, they... Uh, UNHCR um, has really waffled a lot um, with Still respect to, yeah. yeah. Um, so, so they engaged with it really quite early um, and acknowledged a, a limited scope, but always they always um, emphasized that it's not, um, it's not part of the refugee definition. It's obviously not, uh, I mean, you never have to, you can always adapt a more um, generous refugee policy than the convention permits, but it it usually doesn't say that over and over again like it does in the IPA context. But um, it has kind of waffled in terms of what it thinks could be an appropriate um, treaty basis, and it's proposed um, the reasonableness assessment and the safety assessment without, in my view at least, um, really explaining what the legal basis for these is. So that has really given um, wide scope for states to kind of dismiss the guidance in this area. Um, so I would argue that UNHCR should revisit its kind of formal guidelines on the topic and be more explicit about about um, the legal basis for its recommendations. But I don't think, um, yeah, I mean, I see all the time in, in Supreme Court cases and that kind of thing that UNHCR will make an intervention and repeat uh, the safeguards that should be in place, but it doesn't seem to have had that much influence. Mm. Can, can I just ask you, uh, Jeff, uh, from your experience, uh, the, the topic of uh, country of origin information, mm -hmm. how, what the quality of that over the years, have you seen any trends in that? Is that now at a level where the, the information is a lot better than it used to be? Or is it used for national agendas? Or is it, uh, is it skewed? or how? Because this is at the very basis of this, uh, you know, making the right calls in these cases. Mm -hmm. You need to have... Uh, 
a solid basis yeah. for making a judgment. Not one of my strongest areas, and I, mm. I think it's collected, analysed and used in different ways by different states and different jurisdictions, so it's probably quite diff difficult to generalise. Mm. Um, mm. You know, I mean, one of the problems that is being confronted globally is the length of time it actually takes to assess asylum application, which can be anything from a few months to a few years or a decade in, in some cases. Mm. And, mm. and some people have argued you know, that if you have more and more country of origin information to analyse, it actually perpetuates or extends the period of time it takes. At the same time, you could argue that having better country of origin information allows you to make a, a fairer assessment mm. of claims. So I think there are it's a two-edged sword in some ways. Yeah, and just, and just another thing that um, at the same from your experience, the um, uh, the follow-up post-return in this case, yeah. uh, IPA. Yeah. What, well, how's that? The, the general well, I'm very interested difficult. in this topic because. <laughs> I, is the basic position of states, once these people are back home, we forget about them and it's kind of sink or swim as far as they're concerned. Mm -hmm. I would imagine if you're, if you're returning people to their country of origin under fairly controversial uh, situations and to positions of potential danger, mm -hmm. probably the least you know about what happens to them, the better. Mm -hmm. And I've not looked at IPA specifically the way you have. I've looked a little bit at IOM, so-called Assisted Voluntary Return Programs, mm -hmm. where people often rejected asylum seekers are given an offer to be sent back to their country of origin with the full support of IOM. But that support often ends very quickly after they're back in their country of origin. Mm -hmm. As far as I can tell, there's no systematic monitoring process to see whether those people are actually safe uh, once they get back. And I think there's anecdotal evidence to say that some people who go back do experience kind of continued persecution. Right. Mm -hmm. And this is, I mean, in the two contexts we've uh, raised here in the in Kabul and in Mogadishu as well. I mean, these issues uh, should be uh, addressed, I guess, in some way. But uh, that's that it's, mm. it's completely in, in line with my experience as well. That uh, once they're back and the, the short contact with the IOM after the return has finished, the small cash allowance or whichever program you're on, uh, then they're out of sight in a way. And and what happens to them uh, yeah. must be picked up by journalists or other people. And there is no systematic follow up afterwards. But, but I seem mm. to remember a few years ago there was some kind of joint Norway IOM plan to set up some kind of center in Kabul for 18 year old kids who had been sent back. Yeah, and, we can pick uh, up on that. And yes. there's also a lot of discussion about okay, but how long would they stay there? Mm -hmm. Under what conditions would they stay? What would eventually happen to them if they didn't have a family network to return to? But mm -hmm. my understanding is that proposal never actually got off the ground. It's Still. Let's, let's yeah, yeah. Let's get into that. Just, yeah, I think it's an it's an interesting uh, it's an interesting case actually, and we discussed it over lunch as well. So please yeah. just go ahead, and I'll I'll help you. Yeah. Uh, um, I'll, I'll how should we how should we frame it? Um, well, first the history that was relaunched after 2015. Maybe that's a, that's a, maybe that's yeah. a place to start, and it's still not off the ground, as you say. It's not hasn't no. been established. But it's part of the political push post 2015 in Norway. It's still on the table. It's still on the table, right. and there are meetings going on. Even this year, there's been there have been meetings between the Afghan. And was it simply for people over 18, or was it for minors as well? Minors. minors. That's what I want. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Solely for minors. Only for minors. Oh. Yes. Yeah, I guess this. As I've understood. Yeah, I mean, relate. I think actually, it's uh, been discussed for for much much longer than that. Definitely. Probably yes. after, yeah. Uh, from 20. 2008, I think okay. that was the f when the idea first occurred. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. amazing. It's been. Uh, um, and I think that uh, yes. So it's been on the table, but from an IPA, I mean, this. Yeah. Would this be an IPA? An IPA. <laughs> or would it yeah. be uh, rejected asylum seekers being sent back, and they can actually do the return because they are sent back to a safe? Yeah. This is where safe. things kind of yes. blur. I yes. would say. Yes. Tell us. Um, yeah. Explain to us. <laughs> no, I think um, so. The rhetoric around um, a reception center in Kabul for unaccompanied minors um, is. Interesting because um, the way it's discussed is as a uh, as a place where people with no protection need um, can be returned if they if the only reason that they are being returned is the lack of a caregiver, mm. um, an identifiable caregiver. Um, these reception centers have been tried a couple of other times. I think in Angola, Angola yeah, and I think there was two people who. Very small number. Yeah, I, I think, I mean, it's more about the rhetoric, I think, than actual reality of them being used and so forth. But 
Clearly. Um, so the government in discussing these centers um, has consistently said that it is for people with no protection. So their asylum claim has yeah. been refused. And it's not the basis for the refusal of the asylum claim right. itself. Yes. But it does not take a lot of imagination to imagine that implicitly it, it could seep into the uh, asylum determination right. as, uh, as an IPA. So formally, no, it's not, it's not framed as an IPA. Right. But, um, but, but the, the, re the rhetoric is so confused precisely because, because of the reference to people with no protection need. And in Norway, the um, language around having a protection need doesn't refer to people who have a protection need with regard to the place they left. It's they don't have a protection need vis-a-vis uh, -vis their country of origin in general. So uh, even though people who have fled because of a well-founded fear of persecution on some basis um, are, are discussed and talked about in the media and in political discourse as having no protection need because they presumably have an IPA. So whether people with no protection need are people who don't have a protection need because they have an IPA mm -hmm. um, are then returned to these... Uh, centers or or so forth mm, is mm. It's, it's open is, but isn't the center in isn't i think they want to uh i think the plan is uh to do this in uh collaboration with the dutch Danes. government it's a right? danish uh, government danish yeah. not the dutch yeah danish. okay um and i guess that the civil servants working with this hope that uh they never have to actually do it because <laughs> it will just be it will raise a lot of questions and uh and issues, but but as Absolutely. so that I think that I mean that marks you, you mentioned this as well in your book that it uh, post 2015 this mm -hmm. list of measures that you mm -hmm. go into some detail in if you kind of come move a little bit out to the Norwegian case and this was similar in a lot of regimes in in Europe right mm -hmm. uh, uh, was made to deter people from coming more than being good solutions mm -hmm. to or solid, solid legal solutions? I don't know if you want to Yeah, no, I elaborate. think, I mean, I think um, obviously the um, influx of refugees in 2015 gave um, momentum to a lot of the types of policies that we've been seeing for a long time since the mid 80s. Um, the identification of safe third countries, extraterritorial processing, all of, all of these things. Um, what I think is different um, is that uh, some of the new interpretations um, of what's legal and not actually touch on the refugee convention itself. Um, I think in, in response to the Balkans mm. crisis, you know, you would set up temporary protection regimes, sort of parallel regimes of temporary protection that were distinct from refugee status per mm. se. Mm. Um, and that's how mass influx was kind of dealt with. Now we see that more and more states are trying to um, interpret the refugee convention in a way that um, uh, reduces the durability of protection and also kind of limits the geographic scope of protection. Maybe a reception center is the extreme example of a mm. limited space yeah. of protection. But I, yeah. This, this example of the, the children's center in Kabul yeah. reminds, I think there's a lot of parallels with the, the, the consistent uh, idea of having reception and processing centers in North Africa mm. where people's cases can be assessed rather than allowing them into Europe to do that there. Um, the parallel is that for politicians who don't really understand the issue, it's a kind of, it seems to be a quick and easy solution to the problem. It plays very well to the general public because, mm. again, it's, it looks like a relatively humane answer to a, a very tricky situation. But when you start to delve into the operational, legal and ethical practicalities, it never actually comes quite off. So. Mm despite many, many different proposals for reception and processing centres in North Africa, some of which are back on the table right at this very moment. It never seems to get to the implementation phase, and it mm. seems it's the same with this idea yeah. of having a children's facility in Kabul, that mm -hmm. it's actually more complex than it first appears. Mm. Mm. And do, do you see any chance at all, Jeff, for this, having been in the British context and knowing the European and the, uh, the global context? The North Africa thing? Yeah. Yes. I'm establishing these disembarkment. I'm going to say I'm positively pessimistic, if that makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> in the sense that I'm pessimistic, but I think that's a good thing. Right. Because right. 
the North African states, I think without exception now, all of the North African states bordering the Mediterranean have basically rejected this idea mm. and mm. have said they don't want to become dumping grounds for people that Europe doesn't want to admit. Right. Now, yeah. I think we can be fairly uh, sure that the EU will come up with more enticing offers of various forms of assistance, financial, developmental, perhaps even military, mm. in order to try and encourage uh, the North African states to move in this direction. At the moment, fortunately, there seems to be some kind of solidarity amongst that state, those states. Mm. Just recently, I think there was an EU-AU African Union summit mm. at which the African states basically said, forget it, we're not going to go ahead with this idea. Mm. But it's one that I'm sure that the Europeans are going to persist with simply because they can't think of too many other options that would suit their political priorities. Mm. And again, mm. for people who don't really understand the history and the context, this seems to be a relatively simple way of solving a relatively difficult problem. Mm, but mm, mm. If, we would, if we were to come back here in a year's time, I'd be quite surprised if very much progress had been made out actually mm, implementing that proposal. Mm, mm. And just, sorry, Jessica, just picking up on your, the, the externalization, the, mm. that process of uh, European governments, mm. including the Norwegian one, pushing back in mm. a way and getting assistance from transit countries to, to stem migration and control migration. Yeah. Uh, what are the, the, the protection issues along the way? Because if you don't, yeah. there are no centers for, for processing cases. Mm. They don't make it all the way to Europe. Yeah. Uh, s uh, I mean, people are stuck along along the roads, right? In Niger and Mali and uh, maybe Morocco well, and in the thing Sudan. is, what happens to people in the kind of on the desert route towards the Mediterranean? We don't know too much. It's clearly it's clear that there are very high levels of suffering and even deaths mm. on that transit track. We don't know so much about it because there's not so much media focus. International organisations mm. don't have a presence. What we do know a lot about is what is happening for people who are trying to leave Libya by boat, mm. who are intercepted and returned and thrown into indefinite detention uh, by the Libyan Coast Guard. Right. But that Libyan Coast Guard is only able to operate because it's very heavily funded and supported and provided with technical equipment and mm. assistance by the European Union. So Federica Mogherini, the, uh, the European Chief of Foreign Affairs, said in 2016, she said two things. First, she said, I guarantee that nobody who was intercepted by boat will be returned to Libya. And secondly, I guarantee that those detention centers in Libya will be shut down. Mm. Four years later, we yeah. haven't made any progress. In fact, the situation has become even worse. Mm. Right, yeah. Um, um, but Jessica, moving back to, to the Norwegian context, uh, you, uh, this, uh, you're writing a book that uh, the, this concept of... Uh, of reasonableness, forhåndsmessighet, yeah. Norwegian, right? Yeah, proportionality. Yeah. Proportionality. Yeah. Uh, that 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 has taken out of the consideration uh, after 2015 yes. as part of the uh, the furthering the restrictive uh, sides to sides to the regime. But uh, can you just say two words about that? Because that's that's exactly what kind of have had more consequences maybe the politicians knew about when they decided on this. Yeah, I, I think... Sorry for getting into details here, Jeff. No, no, yeah, no, um, no um, yeah, so uh, one of the measures post-2015 uh, um, was, uh, was to um, amend the Immigration Act and remove the requirement of reasonableness from IPA practice in Norway. Um, and uh, this was justified... Um, from a sort of long-term pos uh, position in Norwegian um, policy and also in jurisprudence um, that the reasonableness um, criteria were the subject of uh, disc discretion. They were discretionary. They were mm. ba basically linked up to the requirements or the, the factors that were to be considered in the discretionary grant of humanitarian mm. uh, residence. So they included things like serious health issues or um, whether you're a victim of trafficking or mm. best interest of the child and so forth, the real subset of the issues that mm. are generally considered in the reasonableness assessment. Um, so this is this has always been kind of uh, pointed out as being um, uh, in conflict with uh, with international obligations. And in the 2008 Immigration Act, in the preparatory works, mm. they tried to clarify this and align things with uh, international law. But again, once the immigration regulations came out, it was back to the the old sort of discretionary mm. type of analysis. Mm. And um, this seemed to have been confirmed in as acceptable in um, a 2015 Supreme Court case. So 
when measures were being introduced to try and divert or reduce flows of mm. migrants and refugees to um, to Norway, then uh, then this seemed to be an obvious um, mm. like point to cut out. And even I don't know if people saw the Brennpunkt uh, documentary on on Wednesday, but there you had um, the immigration directorate saying that you know. That we are, we are now. We've sort of cut out our humanitarian um, feel-good uh, margin of mm. um, activity, and mm. we're, now we're really, we're really aligning our practice with minimum standards under international mm. law. So it's mm. always been the position in Norway that reasonableness isn't a, a legal requirement, mm. but rather um, something that is part of uh, mm. uh, policy making. Right. So, I mean, the book the book certainly frames the reasonableness um, it, uh, um, a number of different ways, mm. but definitely anchors it as part of the um, integral uh, part of the IPA test. Mm. I think I think it, yeah. I mean it, it's this is so important because uh, and here in Norway is actually an interesting case for the rest of Europe. I think because yeah. it's spearheading a practice where they uh, uh, they practice cessation of permits already given and also okay. refugee status. Mm. Is is take is revoked within a three year limit uh, with with um, pointing to conditions in the home countries having improved. Mm -hmm. uh, so and this is really being tested out now on the Somali group uh, Somali primarily. Yeah. Uh, but then these things come into question and the and the the, the question of re how reasonable is this after a couple of years in the country having had the permit having believed to have a permanent you know, or being direct you know. In the direct, in going in the direction of permanent stay and then being revoked, or yeah. have you know having their uh, their permits uh, um, revoked? Seized, yeah. Yeah. Revoked, yeah, yeah. I mean, I think traditionally the application of this cessation analysis um, has you know required that the reasons that gave rise to refugee status have mm. been extinguished mm. in the country mm. of origin, right? Mm. So naturally, then um, expecting someone re to return to an IPA. Mm. Um, yeah, it doesn't necessarily indicate that those conditions have have changed. So really, um, this kind of IPA practice within the cessation context is um, is really really problematic for mm. for a number of reasons. And it also, I mean, quite practically um, suggests that the state doesn't can't provide durable protection to mm. people if if there are parts of the country that uh, are unsafe to return to. I, I, I Going into details again, but I think what what uh, struck me as interesting as well in your in your book is that if you send people having their permits, uh, at having a cessation case or an IPA case uh, to a, a limited geographical area as a city mm. and even pockets within the city, and saying that that's that's safe and dignified, basically. Yeah. Uh, could you just elaborate on that? Because what are the kind of minimum conditions, and the minimum scope and area you could send someone to, yeah. and still say it's it's uh, it's you know the the basics are, uh, are fulfilled, yeah. Fulfilled. In place. Well, the way I um, deal with the freedom of movement issue, uh, freedom of movement, right to return, all of these different interests that relate to this emplacement <laughs> within a country, um, is by um, by suggesting that these interests are part of the proportionality assessment mm. in IPA cases. Um, some countries like France require that an IPA is available in most of the country mm. so that you can't simply refer people to um, a city mm. or, or um, even a location within the city. Um, this kind of tendency to identify smaller and smaller pace, places of protection um, also... Uh, is really problematic for specific groups. You're presuming that people know um, how to protect themselves, what area that they can they have a choice of where they go within a place. Um, for women who are returned to, for example, uh, their husband's families or something, their freedom of movement can be constricted mm. in other ways that aren't accommodated at all by this kind of general um, uh, practice. So, um, but in general. I, Obviously, it uh, it's it completely conflicts with the idea that protection should be durable, the durability of protection, and that uh, the the space of persecution should really be an exception to the rule for I IPA to be a legitimate response mm. um, in a refugee claim. I mean, I think 
there are cases where an IPA is uh, is a legitimate practice, mm. but um, one can imagine that those are areas where the risk of persecution really is centered in a small area of the mm. country of origin, and that the the claimant has connections to other areas where um, where which would make uh, relocation and mm. uh, resettlement mm. uh, more um, um, viable. Mm. Okay, May, uh, we can have some comments and, and questions f uh, from the audience if you if you'd like. Uh, anyone want want to comment or uh, ask any question? Could be about the international protection regimes uh, and system, or it could be a, a more on separate issues. Feel free to raise your hand if you want to. Yes, please, Tarja. Uh, There's a microphone. Uh, Tarja Einarsen from the University of Bergen. <laughs> Just to all the uh, people watching the stream or uh, no. go. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, Jessica, you highlighted um, the fact that uh, the, in, the, in, the internal uh, protection alternative uh, uh, was quite early accepted uh, in the UNHCR uh, handbook uh, from 1979, I think. Uh, yeah. um, and, and then in, in the book, uh, and as you also mentioned here, uh, the UNHCR's analysis um, is not really so well grounded uh, in international legal sources. Mm. Uh, and, uh, and this seems to make uh, the doctrine, uh, and especially the criteria of reasonableness, uh, quite vulnerable to uh, more aggressive uh, state practice. Uh, and, and wishes to to to, to limit uh, their international law obligations. Um, so, for instance, uh, I just participated in a debate uh, last week with uh, with a um, the spokesperson for one of the the, the parties in in the go Norwegian government, and 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 he seemed to think and and he he argued or he. He told about this uh, to the audience that the reasonableness uh, was just something that was outside the refugee definition, something that was added uh, on a, on a vol uh, voluntary basis uh, and had nothing to do with, uh, with the law. Mm. Um, and, and do you think, um, the question is really, do, do you think that the UNHCR has fulfilled its mandate by, by not uh, anchoring their analysis uh, more carefully in, in international legal sources? Um, I, think, I think definitely it's, it's played a role in creating a lot of confusion basically around, around the basis for IP practice and also the, um, the criteria. The 1979 handbook actually um, is interesting because I know in Norway, um, early IPA practice um, was justified with reference to the, the handbook. So there's a handbook that guides decision makers on how to interpret, interpret uh, various aspects of the refugee definition, for example. So even though there's no reference to the IPA in the refugee definition, there is um, a sentence in the handbook, as you know, that says, that um, people should not be um, excluded from refugee status just because there was an area in the country of origin that would have been reasonable to relocate to. I, I hope I'm paraphrasing this somewhat correctly. Um, and when I, I actually talked, um, so this, I, I found some commentary on this from um, Gilbert Yeager, who was the head of the Department of Protection at the time the handbook was written. And also someone else who, who talked about, and this was, I think, in um, a submission to a court case on the IPA, just to re-emphasize the fact that this um, paragraph 91 of the handbook was written in an attempt to restrict this incipient IPA practice that um, UNHCR had picked up from jurisdictions, from basically from the Netherlands and from, from Germany. So it wasn't the intention of UNHCR to promote IPA practice in the handbook. Nonetheless, that reference to reasonableness, which in that case was simply um, like a a measure of prudence. It, it, it didn't have any legal meaning in that context. It was just, um, I talked to someone who's working in the Department of Protection at the time also who, who confirmed that 
there are lots of references to reasonableness in the handbook that that simply reflect kind of like a careful tone that they were trying to take um, throughout the handbook that wasn't sort of legally relevant at all. So nonetheless, this concept of reasonableness sort of took on a life of its own and then was justified in various um, uh, guidance notes from UNHCR and then finally in the guidelines on international protection. Um, and I think that uh, UNHCR has tried to link the reasonableness concept with the overarching goal of the convention um, in, in that way. So in, that is a legal argument you can make. Um, but it doesn't... Uh, what's happened is that um, states have put into the reasonableness concept basically only those things that could indirectly lead people to be returned to their area of origin. So the very basic minimum humanitarian standards or other serious harms that aren't persecution related and, and things like that. So I, I think that um, that UNHCR definitely has an opportunity to, to, re to revisit the IPA in light of how it's being interpreted now and give much clearer uh, guidance as to how it should be framed. Um, did that answer your question? Yeah, so, so, yeah. I, so what, what I think you're, uh, you're getting at is uh, that the UNHCR, uh, uh, with well intentions, uh, uh, tried to seek a, a kind of compromise uh, solution um, to a comedy on the one hand the interests of states and, yeah. and on the other hand the interests of, of refugees. Um, uh, but but w what uh, has been perhaps lacking, and I think you discussed this in, in the book as well, uh, is for instance to, to make use of uh, well-known uh, international doctrines of in interpretation or treaties like uh, the implied Vienna invitations Convention. yeah. to, 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 uh, to treaty obligations, that in certain cases it's, it's justified, but if there is an implied limitation, it's still a limitation within the law right. and not something uh, outside of it. Maybe you could elaborate. Yeah, no, I, I think um, it, it could do two things. I think first, and I, I know that this has been a criticism of some of its guidelines for other aspects of the refugee definition, that it doesn't apply um, the Vienna Convention on the Rules of Treaty Interpretation in an explicit way in these guidelines. And those are the rules that kind of govern how, how we're, we're supposed to interpret international treaties. So I think if the UNHCR agrees that it should be understood not as um, a limit on the substance of the definition, which is what it's trying to describe, but actually on the limit, limiting the scope of protection, which is what I've argued in the book, that would be a great step forward in trying to put some structure on the legal analysis and legal practice of IPA because it would mean that the state would have to balance these various interests between the, the state and the individual. Um, but I think it, it should also, in addition, be more explicit about, for example, where the criteria for reasonableness themselves come from. Why, instead of just saying that internal the application of internal flight should um, not prolong situations of ethnic cleansing or something like that. Instead of just saying that, it should say why, why this is a legal obligation of the state that's parallel and should be accommodated within the IPA practice. Um, Thank you. Yeah. Other questions, comments? Um, what, I, I just wanna, uh, um, we're t I just want to hear your uh, thoughts, having written this book on on international refugee law. What what would be the ideal kind of process towards changing this or kind of alienating these different sources? Are there what's the what would be your what's needed in a way? Given the gaps you found, yeah, I think. Uh, I think what is needed is sort of, um, well, well, two things, is, is a recognition of um, the limits of human rights laws and norms on, on refugee law 
practice, I think it's really easy for us to say that human rights law should inform every aspect of a refugee practice. But one thing I do discuss in the book is how this reliance on human rights law, and even in Norway, we see that the reliance on human rights jurisprudence, for example, from the European court, has led to a really low threshold of this for the safety determination in IPA practice. But understanding the relationship between refugee law and human rights law and how human rights law should inform the refugee con um, concept but not limit it is also related to the fact that, that we shouldn't focus um, too much on the presence or absence of state protection as the defining conditions for the refugee concept, that we should keep the refugee, the individual, as the subject of the refugee uh, status determination, um, rather than shifting all of the focus on the, the mechanisms of, of the state and its willingness and ability to provide protection. Because there are just so many um, loopholes that open up in terms of state practice if we do that. Um, in addition to the fact that I think it's, it's, it contradicts the spirit of the convention. Mm. And yeah, and it reminds me of um, something that Atle Grand Matsen, who yeah. was a professor here at the university, said in his first book on the ref on refugee status, which was that, um, which was really advising readers and advising people not to get too hung up on this this notion of state protection um, to the detriment of the the refugee and his or her um, reasons for reasons for moving. Hmm. So. I think that that's a very nice uh, uh, um, place to end, I think. I, and I also want to, uh, I mean, the, the concluding remarks, at the very end of the concluding chapter of the conclusions in the concluding remarks, you end up uh, uh, pointing to uh, that there should be uh, a fair balance between fundamental rights and legitimate state interests. Uh, up and, and, and in that, upholding the privileged position of the refugee in international law. It's a very beautiful final sentence, I think, and uh, that balance is difficult to strike and we're all looking for it. So thank you so much. Thank, thank you, you, Jeff, Jessica. Thank you. Thank you, thank you for coming.